In a lot of the planned videos for this channel on atypical planets or other objects which might host life, or might be terraformed to host life, we're going to be talking about tidal locking quite a bit. I didn't see any videos around that gave a good, quick, and graphic explanation of how tidal locking actually happens in the first place, so we'll delve into it real quick. Incidentally, if you're new to my videos and have some problems understanding me, you might want to turn on the closed captions for this video. You've probably heard a lot of references to tidal locking of planets or moons over the years, but not gotten an explanation for how it happens, just what the final effect is. Moons or planets just do it, and it has something to do with the tides. But what makes a moon slow down so it always has the same side pointing at the planet below? If you're not familiar with tidal locking, it is when a body orbiting another body, like a moon around a planet, or a planet around a star, orbits in a fashion that its own day and year are equal in length. It spins around its own axis just once for every time it orbits around the primary body, so it always shows the same face to those looking at it from the primary body. How does this happen, though? To begin with, any two bodies orbiting together exert tidal forces on each other. That is to say, since gravity gets weaker with distance, there is always a slightly stronger tug on the sides of these objects facing each other. This distorts the bodies, stretching them towards each other, and gives us the tides. This is often called tidal flexing. But that's not the end of the story, because the objects are spinning. Let's picture our moon before it was tidally locked and had a fairly regular day length. And let's pin the Earth and moon in place to keep things simple. As the moon stretches, it is still spinning, and materials take time to stretch and sag. So our bump isn't going to be pointing straight at the planet. It will have spun a bit off-center. Now that the bulge is off-center, the force of gravity being exerted on it is not symmetric anymore. That bump gets poured on, and in the opposite direction the moon is trying to spin. This is called tidal friction, and is no different than putting a brake on a wheel. In time, the moon slows down. But it never stops completely spinning because once its year and day are the same, once it orbits once for every time it spins on its axis, that stretched bump does point straight down at the planet all the time and isn't off-center anymore, so our frictional force goes away. And that's tidal locking. It is just that simple. And the larger body gets the same effect, just much weaker and slower. Earth has an off-center bump too, it's just a weaker effect. This is why the Earth's day was originally about 12 hours long when the moon first formed, and has now doubled that, and the moon has become tidally locked. Eventually, given many billions of years, Earth would slow down until not only did the moon always show us the same side, but we showed it the same side as well. The moon would always be visible to one hemisphere of the planet, but not the other, though it would still wax and wane in that first hemisphere since the moon's phases have to do with which side the moon is pointing at the sun. There is no dark side of the moon, just a side that we can't see. And you have this happen to a planet with a star it orbits too. But not for the star because they aren't rigid objects. They experience some tidal friction from their planets, but they have no faces, so to speak. They do slow down though, just not as much. The same for a gas giant or a ward made entirely of, or primarily of water. Uh, incidentally, that rotational energy that's getting removed to slow the spin of the object dissipates as heat frequently a lot of heat, and that is what is meant by tidal heating. You can also get this from forces exerted by other moons, since many planets have several, and from the eccentricity of a moon's orbit, since things don't usually orbit in perfect circles. Now let's take a quick look at the math. Yeah, yug, right? Well, there's a simplified form that works decently, but this is not a math lesson. What we're interested in here are the factors that control the time tidal locking takes to occur. The composition of the planet, in terms of rigidity, matters because water or ice stretch differently than rock or metal. The masses of the two bodies is important, but what really matters is the mass of the primary body and even more the distance between the two objects. Bigger planets or bigger stars lock their satellites faster, but the single biggest variable is distance. If you double the primary's mass and locking happens four times faster, triple it and it happens nine times faster but doubling the distance makes it take 64 times longer, and tripling it makes it take nearly a thousand times longer. A Mercury is in a partial tidal lock to the Sun, a 3-2 resonance instead of a 1-1, after 4 billion years. Pluto, which is of a similar mass to Mercury, is a hundred times further away. 
a hundred to the sixth power is a trillion. So four billion years for Mercury to get part way there, and four billion trillion for Pluto to. A time so long off that not only would our own sun be long dead, but every star in the universe would be ancient corpses by then. On the other hand, Pluto and its own largest moon, Charon, are already tightly locked to each other, so that you could run a space elevator right from the surface of the one to the other. Gas giants with many moons typically have a lot of them tightly locked, especially the nearby ones. This is why we so often refer to plants around red dwarf stars as being tidally locked. They are much less massive than our own sun, anywhere from 7% to 60% of the mass, so they lock planets much slower, taking as little as 3 to as much as 200 times as long as our sun would for a planet of equal distance. For a planet to interest us in this context, though, it needs to be warm enough for life, and smaller stars put out way, way less power than bigger ones. So planets need to be way, way closer for it to be warm. The smallest of these would need their worlds 50 times closer than Earth is to our sun to be warm enough. Their less massive star might take 200 times longer to lock a planet as far off as Earth, but one 50 times closer would lock in 50 to the 6th power or shorter, meaning that the world would lock many millions of times faster than Earth would around our own sun. Same concept applies for habitable moons around gas giants. So we often assume worlds and habitable zones of red dwarfs will be tidally locked, though newer calculations indicate that atmospheres of worlds interferes with this more than we previously thought. Planetary atmospheres and oceans aren't rigid, and move more freely and circle around, so they slow down the locking process, sort of like in the wheel analogy with the brake, uh, as if we were to dump motor oil on the wheel. But we don't have a great model yet for figuring out how much, but it will be significant, and thicker atmospheres and oceans would slow that even more. So the notion of all red dwarf plants being tidally locked may be an error, especially for bigger dwarves where the plants would be further away. But that in a nutshell is how tidal locking takes place, and why it is so important to discussion of exoplanets and moons. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, and subscribe to the channel to get alerts of future videos. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.